Hello, this is Ipo Swords, and this is going to be a rather long and in-depth video on wood steel, its history, metallurgy, and production. For the most part, it's going to be based upon excellent academic work done by Anne Feuerbach and metallurgical experimentation by John Verhoeven. Before we get into the meat of this video, a quick note on the confusing state of affairs regarding the term Damascus steel. These days, many knife and sword makers market their products as being Damascus steel, and in the modern world this means pattern welded steel. Pattern welded steel is made by folding together two dissimilar steels and etching them. One steel etches more readily than the other, and the contrast between them will cause a visible pattern of bright and dark lines. However, historically, prior to around the 18th century, Damascus steel was also used to refer to woots, or crucible steel, which was produced all over South Asia, East Asia, and the Middle East. In order to be able to differentiate between these two forms of Damascus steel, I will be using the nomenclature of pattern welded steel and woot steel. Let's begin with the obvious question, what is woot? The metallurgical identification of woots is problematic, as no single criteria can be used to differentiate between crucible steel and decarburized wrought iron. In order to confidently say whether a sword is crucible steel or not, the blade must be polished and then etched in nitile, and examined under low magnification microscopy. The presence of spherodized cementite is considered evidence of crucible produced steel. Woots can occur in two different forms, according to Anne Feuerbach. Soft woots with less than 0.08% carbon, and hard woots with greater than 0.08% carbon. The vast majority of pattern presenting woots, and historical woots, is hard woods, whereas the majority of crucible steel that produces no pattern is soft woods. This was common in the early days of crucible steel production. The reason you need so much carbon in order to create woods is the fact that steel will not liquefy until an extremely high temperature. That temperature is reduced by adding carbon. By adding carbon, you can get woods to liquefy at a reasonable temperature for the technology of the day. The appropriate amount of carbon ended up being somewhere around 1 to 1.8%. As a result, this is where we see most hard woods having its carbon content range. The names pulad, fulad, and bulat derive their meanings from the Persian word for purified. Fittingly, Woots also contains lower levels of slag than other types of steel, particularly bloomery iron and decarburized raw iron, as might have been used in Europe and over the world. However, if Woots was produced using decarburized raw iron or bloomery iron as a source of iron, this can introduce slag into the final product. The earliest known swords made from crucible steel date from the first century common era in Luristan. These were identified by the presence of spherodized cementite in their microstructure. Metallurgical analysis indicates that they would not have formed a watered pattern if they were etched. The next archaeological evidence we have of crucible steel swords shows up in the 3rd to 4th century of the Common Era in the Russian North Caucasus. These exhibit similar signs and would not have been pattern forming. Moving along in history, there's a 7th century Sassanid sword, or Persian sword, made of crucible steel. It's a straight double-edged sword with a so-called pistol grip in the classic style of the time. This example, when etched in nitile, showed a true watered pattern, with a fine paralytic matrix interspersed with bands of spheroid cementite. Moving onwards once again, an 8th or 9th century Persian blade currently in the Metropolitan Museum is also made of woods, with both spheroidized cementite and ferrite present in its microstructure. Woods was made in di many different places throughout history. But in the context of the aforementioned ancient finds, the vast majority of woots came from several key regions, which are described in ancient texts such as those by Alkindi, Beruni, Pliny the Elder, and others. These texts claim the iron was generally sourced from either Ceylon or Khorasan, and was then subjected to local variation. In particular, there were forges in Merv, Bukhara, South India, Hyderabad, and Ishafan. Different processes were used to create woots in these regions, with different crucible materials, constructions, and varied crucible charges. Some mentions of unique Indian steel even date back to the 3rd century before the Common Era, in the form of white steel given to Alexander the Great by Indian rulers. Let's move on to how the crucibles were constructed. For the most part, a clay crucible will be filled with a charge, 
which would contain iron, often a mix of soft and hard iron, referred to our kindi as male and female iron, as well as some form of plant matter, such as rice husks, pomegranate peels, wood chips, leaves, or vines. This organic matter served two purposes. Firstly, to provide carbon to the steel, without which it could not melt, and without which it could not produce steel. The second purpose was to produce gases as they pyrolyze, which protected steel from the atmosphere of the furnace. Some processes, such as the Dukhani process, utilized in Hyderabad, used glass as a protective flux. The crucibles were heated for anywhere between 6 hours, as in the South Indian process, to around 2 days in the Dukhani process, or as many as 6 days in the Isfahan process. Woot's buttons present two distinct regions on their surface, with the top of the button having a rough appearance, and often being used to form the spine of weapons, and the bottom of the button having a finer texture, often being used for the edge. On both surfaces, a fine network of dendritic fibres is visible, indicative of the heterogeneous crystalline structure of Woot's. If a crucible charge failed to show good patterns after window polishing, they were sometimes subjected to further heating. In the Isfahan process, the Woot's ingots were taken from their crucibles after firing and placed in a heated room or compartment for two days in order to temper them and relieve stresses prior to forging. This was simply to prevent them breaking if they were mishandled. Isfahan Woot's is particularly well known, as is Khorasani steel. The most famous of Persian sword makers in fact hailed from Isfahan. He was known as Asad Allah, and he was active during the reign of Shah Abbas. There's an interesting legend as to how he rose to such prominence as to be the most famous of Persian sword makers. According to this legend, Shah Abbas held a competition with the intention of finding a new Shamshiraz or swordsmith for his court. In order to root out the best of the best, he ordered a prize for a swordsmith who could cut an iron helmet given to him by an Ottoman Solomon in half without damaging their sword. All contestants failed, but one, Asad Allah, whose names literally translate to Lion of God, approached the helmet, swung, and cleaved it in two without rolling an edge. My Asad Allah Shamshir also has its own fascinating bit of history. I can't confirm this as it happened 400 years ago and documentation is sparse. However, it makes sense given where this sword was found in Poland and the fact that it's made by Asad Allah signed by Asad Allah under Shah Abbas, and has the right sword of Wootz for that era. Anyway, on to the story. In 1601, Sigmund Czechi Vaza, or Zygmunt III, the King of Poland, sent an Armenian merchant Sefer Muratovich on a commercial mission to Isfahan with the instructions to procure rugs woven with the royal arms, which are actually in the Krakow castle these days, as well as costly fabrics, tents, and weapons. Specifically, sabres with blades of watered steel. This is likely one of those watered steel blades. It's from the correct period, has the correct form, and is from the correct country of origin. It's also made from the highest grade of Woots, by the very best of makers. The steel is highly spheroidized, with cementite particles forming very distinct rafts, the bright white lines you can see here. It's characteristic of a Sadala work from around 1600 to 1607. It was also found in Poland, which fits the above theory. As mentioned, this has a particularly rare and valuable form of Wootz. The Wootz on this sword is known as Kara Karason Wootz, or Black Wootz from the Karason region. It has a distinct styling, being dark with fine, light, tight swirls, which are formed when the specific ore is used to make a specific type of steel which is forged in a very particular way. This sword has gone through some resharpening, and as a result, it has some damage to the signature. Regardless, it's still possible to read that it was made by a Sadala. You'll note that on the edge of this blade, you can see an extremely dense, parallel cementite raft structure. The high density cementite in this region is characteristic of Woot swords produced by a Sadala. The intensely forged edges are more resilient and more resistant to deformation, as well as being able to be made sharper as there is an increased proportion of cementite to sorbite in that region. Woot swords have a characteristic pattern, such as the one shown on screen from Leo Figuil's book on Damascus steel. We can compare these patterns, which are described as being made by Asad Allah, to the Asad Allah in my collection. You can see the same compressed grain structure on the edge, 
and the mottled spirals in the grains of the body of the sword. These are indicative of processes used by Sadala in order to produce a fine edge and a strong body. The secret to producing wood steel was lost for a long time, as the ore sources dried up around 1750 and wood's production ground to a halt. Crucible steel was still being made, but it lacked the distinct patterns in the steel, which had served as a guarantee of quality in the past. It is only recently, through the combined efforts of John Verhoeven and the late Alpendre, that it was revealed that the trace amount of carbide forming elements in Woot steel was responsible for the pattern formation. In particular, the pair discovered that vanadium was a vital alloying element in pattern formation. Recently, Verhoeven actually revisited the topic with a 2018 paper titled Damascus Steel Revisited, in which experimentation solidified his claim that internal banded microstructures resulted in microsegregation of vanadium between dendritic and interdendritic regions of the ingot during solidification. Vanadium therefore acts as a nucleation point for cementite spheroid formation, leading to linearly aligned bands of cementite after forging. In other words, vanadium acted as a nucleation point where cementite carbide could form into a sphere. Where there was a small amount of vanadium, you would get spherical carbides forming. These hard carbides would form into bands or ra, which would then be aligned during forging and create the distinctive cementite patterns, which appear as bright white lines on wood steel. I've not gone into too much depth in this video, and there's a lot more that could be said, including detailing different ways that each region produce wood steel. If you're interested, I can make a whole series of videos on this topic, as it's something I personally find fascinating. This has been a top level overview of some of the history of wood steel, some of how it's produced, and some of the swords made by famous smiths. I hope you've enjoyed the video, because that's all I've got for you today. Until next time, stay sharp.